Yes, you may. Uh, number one, the, the state has subpoenaed Dr. Miller. Um, you know, we'd like to have him stay at his hotel, which is at the Hyatt downtown. Uh, we have rides coordinated so we can bring him back here. Uh -huh. I don't see any point in having him you know, sit in a room for all day either, but that's, I would rate, I'll honor the speed, of course, but we'd like him to stay at his hotel instead. Um, how quickly can he get here? Well, about 15 minutes. Okay. That should be fine, well, right? If there is a rebuttal with us, we've not heard about it. The right. state has not uh, indicated any witness to be called today. And I know that the court referenced the rebuttal with us. Yeah. We'd like notice. All right, is the state intending to call the rebuttal witness expert? Your Honor, the state's rebuttal is entirely dependent on the testimony of the defendant at this point. Okay, so you haven't decided yet. All right. Um, I just want to make it clear that um, uh, if Officer Potter testifies inconsistently with what she said to Dr. Miller, I think it's fair game for the state to call Dr. Miller to testify. Okay, That is not going to open the door to the defense asking the ultimate question. I just want to make that crystal clear, okay? So, so I know, Your Honor, you're, you're, uh, if they ask questions on that report, did you say this, did you say that? That, and now the jury knows that she was interviewed by Dr. Miller, and they're gonna wonder what the diagnosis was. We never mentioned that she was interviewed by Dr. Miller. That opens the door, doesn't it? Uh, no, because Mr. Gray, that would just be pure impeachment of her factual testimony. Okay, what happens if she says, no, I didn't say that? It was on a Zoom meeting, and it wasn't recorded, and she says, I didn't say that. And then they recall Miller. Does that open the door? No, because it would just be pure impeachment well, of now her we have a, factual we, testimony. Well, now we have a situation where he interviewed her he wrote a report, and they're making, and they're going into that, and we can't show the result of his interview and his report, even though they're going into it. That, that's not fair to the defendant, Your Honor. Not well, Mr. Gray, that's my ruling. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I didn't make any mistakes. Up there. Okay, I don't want to do that. All right. Okay. Um, Let's get the jury. Your okay. Honor, before we do that, if, if it is the defense's intention to call the defendant at this point, I think we have to make a proper record before that happens. We already uh, did. I, I think I already asked um, Officer Potter whether or not she still wanted to testify. I would just confirm that as of today, I would just make an additional record, Your Honor. Well, is your decision the same? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you. Okay, just that. Please be seated. The state may call its next witness, yes, or excuse me, the defense. Yes, ma'am. Defense calls Kim Potter to the stand. Okay, Ms. Potter. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear under penalty of perjury that you are truthful? 
trouble with your questions. I do. This case. I do, Your Honor. Please have a seat and please remove your mask. And Ms. Potter, I gave the rules for testifying and you've been in the courtroom. Do you need to, or need to repeat them? No, Your Honor. Okay. Um, state your full name and spell it. Kimberly, K-I-M-B-E-R-L-Y-A-N-A-N-N, -N -N, Potter, P-O-T-T-E-R. All right, counsel. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Ms. Potter, will you speak into the mic because both of your lawyers have a hard time hearing. Yes, there's just the next here. Okay, um, you stated your full name. How old are you, ma'am? 49. And are you married? Yes. And is your husband in the courtroom? Yes, he is. And what's his name? Jeff Potter. And how long have you been married? Over 25 years. And uh, when did you first meet your husband? When I was 15. And you were in high school? Yes. And did you reunite much later? Yes, when I was in college. <clears throat> and uh, what does your husband do? He works for a health care system now. Is he a retired police officer also? Yes, he is. And where was he a police officer? Fridley, Minnesota. Was he also a member of a drug task force? Yes, he was. And um, with respect to your children, do you have children? Yes. And what are they, two boys? I have two boys. And what are their names? Uh, Nicholas and Samuel. And are they in the courtroom? No, they're not. And where is Nicholas? He's an active duty Marine. And where's that at? He's currently stationed in Florida. And your other son, where is he at? He's in college in North Dakota. And are they going to be home for the holidays? Yes, they will. Is your mother in the courtroom? Yes. And your sister? No, she's not. But is your brother in the courtroom? Yes, he is. And besides your brother and your mother, your father is deceased? Yes. And do you have any other siblings? I have another sister and a brother. And what are they, do you know what their ages are? Um, my sister, my oldest sister is in her 50s, and my other brother is in his 50s also. And what do they do for a living? My sister works for a medical device company. Uh, my oldest brother works for a parking company, and my other brother works for retail. Going back to when you were a youngster, uh, where did you go to elementary school? Immaculate Conception Catholic School. And where was that located or is located? Columbia Heights, Minnesota. And did you live in that neighborhood? Yes, I did. While you were at elementary school, while you were going to that school, did you uh, have a police officer visit your school? Yes. And do you actually know his name today? Yes, it's Officer Michael McGee. And where was he a police officer at? The Columbia Heights Police Department. And why was he at your school? He was doing bicycle safety for grade school kids. And you remembered his name. Anything else that was significant about him that caused you to do something in your life? He was, on that occasion, he really influenced me as a youngster that the police are good people and I wanted to be something like that someday. And because of that and because of him being at your school, did you start out doing that? Yes. And what was your first job or volunteer work as a some type of a law enforcement officer, student, explorer, school cop? That well, the work? first thing I did was I, when junior high, was a school patrol officer, if that counts. Yes, that does count. And what did a school patrol officer do back then? Uh, it was junior high, so we helped the younger uh, grade school age children get across the street. <clears throat> and did you continue to do that throughout junior high? Yes, 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. And after getting into high school, what did you do? Um, the Fridley Police Department came to my high school and had a booth set up for the Fridley Police Explorers. And did you, did you join the Explorers? Yes, I did. Why did you join the Explorers? First of all, what is an Explorer? It's part of the Boy Scouts of uh, America. It's an area where you can have career enhancement or you can learn about different jobs like law enforcement or uh, firefighting, things of that nature. 
And were you an explorer throughout your high school days? Yes, I was. I can't remember if I asked you what high school you went to. Uh, Tatino Grace High School in Fridley. <clears throat> with, with respect to criminal justice or law enforcement, while you were in high school, besides being an explorer, did you do anything else? I had jobs. Okay, what was your job? Uh, my first job was at a gas station. What did you do there? Uh, a clerk, cashier. And did you continue that job throughout high school? Yes, and into college. Okay, so your next visit was college. Yes. Where did you go to college? St. Mary's College in Winona, Minnesota. And um, that's about, what, 70 miles from here, 80? Yeah, it's down towards La Crosse. Okay, it's in Winona? Yes. <clears throat> and did you, what was your major at St. Mary's? Criminal justice and sociology with an emphasis on um, elderly studies or geriatric sociology. Why did you take those courses? I wanted to go into law enforcement and I had an interest in serving the older community and understanding their needs and wants. Did you graduate from St. Mary's? Yes, I did. And was that a three-year program, four and a four It years? was a four-year program. I finished it in three and a half because I had an internship in the summer. And where did you internship? Uh, the Columbia Heights Police Department. Columbia Heights Police Department? Yes. Okay. And what did you do at the Columbia Heights Police Department? I was assigned to an officer who was in their um, community-oriented policing uh, program. Were you also, did you also continue your explorer career while in college? Um, I stopped being an explorer after my freshman year, and then I role-played at the annual conference. What does that mean? Um, every year the Explorer program had an annual conference at Breezy Point Resort and they needed role players and they liked to use students or people that were in law enforcement. So <clears throat> you you graduated from St. Mary's? Yes. And you, what did you do after that? After that I would have gone to skills in the summer of 1990. Four. Okay, and what do you mean by that? I went to skills. What, at, does, what does that mean? I went to the police certification program so and I could where, get hired. And where was that at? Alexandria Technical College. In Alexandria, Minnesota? Correct. So everybody knows about 120 miles? 30 yes. Feet? And did you stay there while you were being educated? Yes. How, what kind of a program was that? How long was it? It was 10 or 12 weeks. And what do you mean, is that where you obtain your skills to, to apply for a, as a police officer? Yes, it was a hands-on training. I had the college education, the book knowledge, and then I went there for my skills program or my hands-on um, part from my, getting my license. After this uh, program, uh, did you go out and try and get a job in law enforcement? Yes, I did. And were you successful at first? Yes. Well, did you have a job at Anoka? Um, Anoka? Yeah, Anoka? I worked at the Anoka Metro Regional Treatment Center because I graduated in January, or I'm sorry, in December. I couldn't go to skills until the next summer, so I had to get a. I got a job. All right. So, but you worked skills. You were you, you're in Alexandria, correct? Yes. And the job you got was at Anoka State Hospital. Yes. <clears throat> That was between your skills. Say that again. So slow I got hired there in February, and I worked for a year on a, a calendar year. Uh, but the Anoka City Police Department would allow their students to, um, or their employees, I'm sorry, to go to skills and still have a job on weekends or when they would get back before they got hired as a law enforcement officer. So. At Anoka State Hospital, what did you do? I was a security officer. And uh, Anoka State Hospital is for is basically a detox center now, is that right? No, it, it had a detox. It had a countywide detox and a, a detox program. It also had drug and alcohol abuse rehabilitation and mental illness. And what did you do there? You are in security? Yes. Does that mean you had to deal with the folks that are staying there, the residents? Yes. And were you successful in that? Yes. After working there, where did you go next? Um, 
I left there and got hired at the City of Brooklyn Center. And what year were you hired at the Brooklyn Center Police Department? 1995. And when were you sworn in? February the 27th. Of 1995? Correct. Who was that you're swearing? Uh, my mother and my father. So after you're sworn in, you started working as a Brooklyn Center police officer? Yes. And what year was that again? 1995. So that would be, my math, 26 years before you resigned? Is yes. that a fair statement? Yes. <clears throat> when you worked as a police officer at Brooklyn Center, throughout those 26 years. Did you remain a patrol officer all during that time? I did. And why was that? Why didn't you attempt to go up the ladder like the other officers we heard from? I liked my work. I enjoyed working with community. I didn't want to be in an administrative role. But did you also, uh, even though you were a patrol officer, you did take part in other programs, for example, the FTO program, right? Yes, I did. And that's a field training? Yes, I was a field training officer for many years. How, how many years? Uh, I don't have uh, an exact number, 10 to 15. And we've learned in this, court, in this case what a field training officer does, but very briefly, what did you do? Um, I would get probationers in different um, stages of their training, either in their first phase, their second phase, their third phase, or their final phase. Um, usually the primary phase or the first phase and the final phase were always with the same FTO. And then other, F, uh, other FTOs would train the other two stages. And why did you continue, continue to do that for so many years? I felt that I had knowledge and mentorship that I could help young officers develop into somebody I would want to work with and my partners would want to work with. There were other programs that you volunteered for or joined while yes. you were a police officer, is that correct? Yes. And after you became a police officer, what was the first program that you joined or volunteered? I became an explorer advisor for our explorer post. And what's an explorer post? Is that the younger people that are? Yes, the program through the Boy Scouts of America. And in that program you teach them about policing, is that right? Yes. And after, after that Explorers program that you joined, what else did you do as a police officer? I was officer? on the domestic abuse response team. I was also a crisis negotiator. Let's stop at the domestic, domestic abuse program. When did, how long were you on that? Approximately. 10, 12 years, maybe more, maybe less. And what did that program entail? Um, we would respond, so officers would go out on domestic abuse situations or domestic calls, and if there was a victim of a crime or an arrest made or not an arrest made, we would follow up the next day with the victims um, to see that they were getting the things they needed, like domestic advocates, um, walking them through, getting order for protections if they had questions, and then helping them and checking in with them through the court process. And did you enjoy doing that? Yes. Why? Sometimes there were great successes and sometimes there were very sad failures. There's another program that you're involved in, it was a hostage program? I was a crisis negotiator for the, uh, the apparent um, umbrella of the EOU team, the Emergency Operations Unit. And what did you do in that? I was a crisis negotiator. What does that mean? Um, we would go out on barricaded subjects or we would go out with the, I guess a SWAT team would be the easiest way to describe it, on warrants. Um, we would respond to calls where there may be people in danger. And was your job to try and negotiate with the subject and get him to submit to being arrested? Or yes, he him? or she. Was that your main job? No, I was always a patrol officer. No, I mean, as far as a hostage negotiator, that's what you did. Yes, I was a crisis negotiator. <clears throat> and um, what other programs were you in? Um, I was on the Law Enforcement Memorial Association Honor Guard. And what is that? Um, it's So the parent is the Minnesota Law Enforcement Memorial Association. Um, they do a lot of work to help survivors and their families 
um, make their way through the process of getting benefits after their officer is killed in the line of duty. Um, I was on the honor guard. What did you do being on the honor guard? When I started in 1998, I was on the colors team for approximately a year or two, and then I went to the uh, casket team. Well, what's the color team? The color team carries flags. And the casket team? We would carry the casket or the urn of the fallen officer and then fold their uh, flag. And would you be in contact also with the victim or the deceased family? Sometimes with the family, a lot of times with the chief of police because I would have to hand the, I would and have to give the folded flag to the police chief. And this was throughout the state of Minnesota? Yes. And these were police officers killed in the line of duty? Yes. Or other law enforcement officers? Most of, uh, 99 percent of it would be killed in the line of duty or we would do some retiree funerals. Any other programs you were involved in? I did a lot of crime prevention work for our police department and other presentations. Crime prevention presentations? Yes. What were those? Um, I was assigned an apartment complex in the city and I would meet with management and we would um, do some programming for their residents as far as personal safety, locking your car doors, taking valuables out of your cars, just regular safety in an apartment complex. And then I would do um, some other um, presentations on robbery prevention for banks in the city. By the way, when you were doing the um, carrying caskets for that, in that program, were you aware of uh, office, officers that w were killed in the line of duty by making a traffic stop? Yes, Sean Patrick from Mendota Heights. Objection, Your Honor. Move to strike. Yeah. The objection is overruled. I'll let the answer stand. During your 26 years as a police officer, did you ever receive any complaints for abusing your power? No. Did you ever receive any complaints from the public? No. In training, did you attend all the training sessions required by the Brooklyn Center Police Department while you were there? Yes. And with respect to uh, gun training, laser training, you, you attended all those too, right? Yes, I did. And did you pay attention? Yes, I did. With respect to that, in your approximation, I'm, I'm not asking for exact numbers, but with respect to the training, what would you say the amount of training was for for the firearm, for the gun, and the amount of training for the laser? What would be the percentages there? For the firearms, uh, it would be probably 80%. We spent a lot more time on firearms than we did on taser. And tasers didn't come into the being until years after you're a law enforcement officer, right? Yes, I believe trainers in this courtroom had said 2002 or 2003. And you started as a law enforcement officer, what year? 1995. With respect to laser, tasers, I say lasers, with respect to tasers, there's been evidence in the case that you had a Taser 7, is that correct? Yes. And the evidence in that was that the Taser 7 had a shape like a gun, fair statement? Yes. And the Taser 7 had a dark black, or at least a dark handle, and a dark top. Objection. Do you remember that? Objection. I'm trying. The objection is overruled. You may answer. Yes. The, the Taser that you received, was it approximately a month before uh, April 11th that you received this taser, do you remember? In the courtroom I was told I received it on March the 26th. Okay, and um, also let's, while we're there, with respect to these tasers and testing them, uh, the rule that we read said should test the electronics every day, is that mm -hmm. right? Yes. And there is testimony that you didn't test yours a couple days, is that right? Yes, that's what I was told. And uh, do you agree with that, that you didn't test it? I don't recall if I would have or wouldn't have. And was that an important feature 
for law enforcement officers with new tasers? No. That n never used them since they had them? Correct. And while we're there, did you ever use a taser, use it by actually shooting it in all of your years career as a law enforcement officer? I would take my taser out on rare occasions, but I don't believe I ever deployed it. Okay, when you take your taser out, it's to de-escalate what is going on, is that a first statement? Sometimes, or to prepare for what might be behind a door. Sometimes an officer has a gun and sometimes an officer has a taser out. All right. And now the taser that was switched from you, did that go to one of your partners, that taser? My old taser? Yes. Um, I believe they were just put in storage at the police department. And those tasers were all yellow, right? The yeah. handle, the top, the whole thing was yellow. First yes, statement. except for the battery pack, I believe that was black, and there was some okay. markings on the side. I'm going to show you these tasers. Show you this taser. Yes. All right, the objection is sustained. Okay, well, <clears throat> do you specifically remember your old taser? By that I mean the one before the seven uh, being all yellow? Yes. And um, was that an X26 taser? I believe it was an X26P. P? So, With respect to the tasers, there's been evidence about signing some forms on warnings. Do you remember signing those forms? In our annual training, we would be handed a form to sign, and I would sign it. And do you remember the warnings on them at all? Not from those days, no. And with respect to weapons confusion, was there ever any training, actual training, about weapons confusion as you remember it? No. Did you even know what weapons confusion was? Before? Yeah. Wait till I finish the question. Before April 11th? It would be mentioned in training, but it wasn't something we physically trained on. And by that you mean what? There was no training on weapons confusion. You wouldn't be sitting in a dark room and told to grab which weapon. So, I'm going to go now to April 11, 2021, a Sunday, and uh, you surely remember that day, is that correct? Yes. And you were an FTO that day for Officer Lucky? Yes, I was. And that day, what time did you go on duty? 6 a.m. And was Lucky on duty at that time too? Yes. And about, what did you do during the morning? If you remember, did you just, just do drive around piece, police work? We just did police work. He would, we would have checked a squad car if we wouldn't have had calls right away. Um, it was a Sunday. It yeah. was a Sunday. So approximately around 2 o'clock, um, did you pull up in back of, or not you, Officer Lucky was driving the car, right, the squad? Yes. And you were the... Uh, FTO, where were you seated in the car? In the passenger seat. And tell the jury what you remember about first seeing the white Buick on that day, approximately 2 p.m. And I talk slowly. Officer Lucky and I were driving south on Zane Avenue North. We were talking about pursuit policies, um, doing some regular FTO training and he observed a vehicle in the turn lane with a blinker on inappropriately. 
And was that the white Buick? Yes. And did you have a conversation with him about that? Yes. And what was that conversation? Uh, we discussed a little bit of suspicious activity. Um, he noticed uh, a pine tree or uh, air freshener hanging from the rearview mirror and the, the tabs were expired. And uh, did he want, did you stop that vehicle? Officer Lucky wanted to stop the vehicle, yes. And let me ask you a sort of a hypothetical. If you had been working alone that day on Sunday afternoon at 2 o'clock, would you have stopped the vehicle for? I can't even finish the question, Your Honor. All right. That's not fair. The it's simply, they, don't, they know how to try a lawsuit, okay. I would think. The objection is overruled. You may answer. My question was, if you weren't with a field training officer that day and you were on patrol alone, would you have stopped that vehicle? Most likely not. And why not? An air freshener to me is not, it's just an equipment violation. And during the COVID times, uh, the high COVID times, um, the Department of Motor Vehicles was so offline that people weren't getting tabs and we were advised not to try to enforce a lot of those things because the tabs were just not in circulation. Okay, but you, you did stop the vehicle, right? Yes, part of field training is that my probationer would make numerous contacts with the public throughout the day. And um, what happened after the stop? If you remember, uh, you've, go ahead. Before Officer Lucky stopped the car, he ran the vehicle, uh, confirmed that the registration was expired and that the registered owner had a petty misdemeanor type warrant for some type of drug offense. And that was the registered owner of the vehicle? Yes. <clears throat> so after you, and you did that while you were still in this quad car and not? Yes, it's part of the multitasking that a probationer will have to do is run a vehicle license plate, call into dispatch, and initiate their lights. Okay, and one, try and talk a little slower. I know you're probably nervous, but I'd like to get all this in. All right. Yes, sir. Okay, so you stop the vehicle, is that right? Officer Lucky initiates the traffic stop. And what happened after he did that? Um, the vehicle stopped kind of in an entrance to the church on 63rd, and he got on the PA and told the vehicle to pull ahead just a short distance. Was that because he was parked in the driveway of the... Yeah, and I think there was a vehicle trying to come out, as I recall. Okay. What happened next? Officer Lucky and I exited our marked squad car. Um, Officer Lucky walked up to the driver's door, and I stood at the right rear corner of the white Buick. So you did get out of the car? Most definitely. And why did you stand where you were standing? Part of it was so I could see where Officer Lucky was um, and to provide cover to see what else was in the vehicle. In your experience of 26 years and being a patrol officer all those years, is stopping any vehicle at any time that you don't know, does that be considered a dangerous situation? Yes. Why? Sometimes there's guns in the car, sometimes there's uncooperative people. You don't know who you're stopping. Yeah, because you don't know, right? Right. So, while you're standing there um, in the rear of the vehicle, did you hear what Officer Lucky said? I could hear parts of the conversation. Um, he didn't seem to be in any distress when he was asking questions. He took out his notepad um, and it looked like he was writing down something which would end up being a name and a date of birth. Okay, and after he did that, did you two go back to the squad car? Yes. And at some point in time during the stop or right after it, um, did Officer Lucky do anything with in connection with obtaining another squad car? Yes, he called for a second car to come. What uh, is that about? What? Uh, it would just be a backup officer. The registered owner had a, a warrant of some nature. It wasn't a, a, a bad warrant. It was just a regular petty warrant, um, which would still, you'd want a second officer. Or I guess in this case, a third officer. Officer Lucky and I are considered only one officer. 
And why is why are you unlucky? Just one officer? Because he's in field training and he's a probationary employee. All right. So, did the third officer, Officer Johnson, arrive at some point in time? Yes, Sergeant Johnson arrived. And um, was that before you looked up in the computer about this uh, driver of the vehicle, or after? I I don't know exactly when he arrived. I know Officer Lucky and I were doing, uh, or Officer Lucky and I were discussing running. Um, the name he was given through some various systems. Okay, and did you do that, you and Officer Lucky? Yes. Was there any um, correction that you told him about during this time that he shouldn't have put the name in one? He had gone to the Minnesota, because the, re the driver didn't provide him with any government issued ID, he would have had to verify some information to run him properly in our system through TriTech. Um, so you run them sometimes through Minnesota DVS uh, with just a, a name and a date of birth. It'll give you a Soundex hit on various people with that same, either same name or common name with a date of birth. So did you correct him on that? We were talking about, I don't know if I corrected him on it, but. So what happened after that? Um, he would copy the OLN, which is a driver's license number, um, off the screen and then put it into our, tr our TriTech system or CAD and that would run him through the state for driver's license and warrants and other hits. And did you f uh, find anything about the driver? The driver came back with a suspended driver's license, a gross misdemeanor, bench warrant for weapons, and a protection order. So a gross misdemeanor for weapons ordinance, what went through your mind, if anything, when you read that? It would be concerning that there'd be a weapon on the person or in the vehicle. And why would that be? In my experience over 26 years, I have found guns in cars, either by accident or by them just being sitting out in plain view. And what about a person with a weapons warrant? They're, They're more likely to be carrying a weapon or have a weapon access to them. So um, what about the temporary, was it a temporary restraining order that came up? Was that it? Or, uh, yeah, I think they're called ex parte orders. It would be a temporary protection order until the parties would either have a court hearing uh, in front of a judge to make it a permanent order. And there would be a name of a female on that? Yes, order? there was. And was there a female in the Buick or in the automobile that was stopped? Yeah, in the front, yes, in the front passenger seat. So after you learned that, did you also learn something? Did Officer Lucky tell you something about drugs or marijuana? He came, he, when he initially got back to the car, he told me there was a, a obvious smell of marijuana and some seedlings or shake uh, residue on the center council and inside the vehicle. Okay. So with all of that information, what did you do next? Uh, we told Officer Lucky explained to Sergeant Johnson what was going on. Um, I corrected Where was him. Sergeant Johnson? Was he in your squad car? He was standing at my passenger door. Go ahead. And... Uh, Officer Lucky was explaining to Sergeant Johnson what was happening and what we need, what he wanted to do. Um, Officer Lucky only told Sergeant Johnson that he had a warrant, and I told Officer Lucky that he needed to tell Sergeant Johnson what the warrant was for. Um, a weapons violation warrant would be cause for care and, and concern. All right, and after that conversation, what happened, if anything, next? We got out of the vehicle, Sergeant Johnson, was going to the passenger side. And oh, excuse me, uh, don't me interrupt you. What was, back up a little, I'm getting ahead of me. What was the plan when you got out of your vehicle with Lucky and Johnson was outside? What was your plan? The plan was for Officer Lucky to get the driver into custody for the warrant and we'd further investigate with the female who she was and if she was the petitioner or the subject of the restraining order. Were you required by policy and law in learning about that warrant to arrest the driver of that car? Yes, it was an order of the court. And with respect to the restraining order or whatever you called it, um, did proper police procedure that you knew of for 26 years required to find out who that lady was? Yes. And why would that be? It's my duty to find out who she is to make sure she's not in harm's way. Um, there's been times when that hasn't happened and somebody has ended up um, killed. 
because that wasn't followed. So now we're at the Buick. It's a Buick car, white car. It's a right? white car. And now we're at the white car, and you three went up to it, correct? Yes, yeah, Sergeant Johnson where, went to the passenger side. Go? He went up the passenger side to provide cover. And what does provide cover mean? Keep an eye on the occupants of the vehicle um, and just to monitor what's happening outside in the world. See if and people are walking up on you or things go wrong. And where were you located? I was towards the left rear corner of the car. And where was Officer Lucky? He was advancing to the driver's door. And how, by the way, before this, how long had you known Officer Lucky? I think we were on our fifth shift. And he was pretty new arrival, was he? Or? I believe he was in second phase, maybe. But he had been a police officer before. Okay, what does second phase mean? Um, he wasn't in his initial four weeks. He was in the start of his second four weeks. Yeah, and you testified you knew, at least back then, that he had come from another police department, correct? Yes, I think he worked at two previous agencies, and he was an explorer. Okay. Now let's go back to when you three arrived at the white car. Um, we've already said where you're located. Officer Lucky was at the driver's door, is that right? Yes, he would have been standing behind the post between the driver's door and the, pa the rear passenger door. What do you mean by that, standing behind the post? He wouldn't have been directly in front of the door because that would be an unsafe approach. And it, this was a, was this a warm day? Was the window down? Remember? I don't know if the window was down or not. Okay. But in any event, where were you standing again? At the left rear corner. And uh, did you hear what Officer Lucky said? Yes, to? I heard him ask the driver to step out of the vehicle a couple of times. And um, did the driver step out of the vehicle finally? Finally, he asked Officer Lucky a couple of times what was going on, and Officer Lucky said he would explain to him. When he got out of the car? Yes. And so did the driver get out of the car? Yes. And what do you remember happening next? Officer Lucky had him turn around, and I think he was still asking what was going on. Um, Sergeant Who's he? John. Who's he? Um, the driver. Go ahead. And Sergeant Johnson and um, Lucky told him he was under arrest, and I told him he had a warrant. Okay, so who said he was under arrest first? Uh, Sergeant Remember? Johnson, I believe. And Sergeant Johnson testified here. Remember that? Yes. And after he said that, did Officer Lucky say he was under arrest too? Yes. And you heard that? Yes. And uh, what did you say then? I told him he had a gross mis uh, I told him he had a warrant. You just said warrant? I think so. Did you specify what kind of warrant, if you remember, if you don't? I don't think I would have. It wouldn't have been in my normal. Okay, so what happened after Johnson and Lucky said you're going to be handcuffed or you're under arrest, and you said yes. that there was a warrant. What happened next? Uh, Officer Lucky had him put his hands behind his back, and I noticed that in uh, the driver's right hand was some type, was something. It was paper or something, um, and I took it out of his hand and had it in my left hand. And you had that in your left hand? Yes. And then what happened next? Why did strike that? Uh, when you did that, I take it you got closer to the uh, driver? Yes. I reached into the driver's hand and, and took out what he had in his right hand. When had right it hand or left hand? His, his right hand, and I held it in my left hand. Okay. And what happened next? Uh, Officer Lucky started to say something about, don't do that, don't tense up, stop doing that. And then it just went chaotic. What do you remember happening after that? I remember a struggle with Officer Lucky and the driver at the door. Um, the driver was trying to get back into the car. Uh, well, he was trying to get back in the car. What did you do? I went around Officer Lucky as they're trying to get back in the door. I'm between the door and Officer Lucky and, and the driver. And the driver's getting into the car. And 
what happened next? They're still struggling, and I can see Sergeant Johnson and the driver struggling over the, the gear shift because I can see Johnson's hand, and then I can see his face. And you, you knew Johnson for many years before this, is that right? Yes. And by looking at his face at that point in time, what did you interpret it to mean? He had a look of fear on his face. It's nothing I'd seen before. Did you say anything when you saw this? What did you do? We were struggling. We were trying to keep him from driving away. It just, it just went chaotic. I, it. And then I remember yelling, "Taser, taser, taser!" And nothing happened. And then he told me I shot him. Can you proceed or do you? Yes, it's fine. Okay. After the driver said you shot him, do you remember what you said? Or do you, if you don't remember, did you look at the video and see what you said? Or do you actually remember what you said, I guess is my question, not with help from a video? I don't remember what I said. And what do you remember next, if anything? Uh, I rem they had an ambulance for me, and I, I don't know why. And then I went. Then I was at the station. I don't remember a lot of things afterwards. Do you remember saying something about prison? No. If you did say that. Do you have any idea now why you would say that? No. Was but the climate back then about police officers a little rough? Objection, Your Honor. No. The objection is sustained. All right. You don't remember saying it? No. And you don't know why you said it? No. Do you, did you, do you remember the response that our Sergeant Johnson or Major Johnson gave you? No. And when next do you remember what happened, if anything, if you remember? I remember getting an ambulance, and then I was at the station. Okay. And you remember being in the ambulance, arriving at the station? No. You don't remember the no. station? I remember getting to the station. Once you got to the station, do you remember what happened next? Um, the next thing I remember is Officer Fricky was in the room with me. And where were you located? Do you remember that? Uh, in the front office. Okay. In the front office room, do you remember? Were you sitting down, standing up? I, w I was on the floor. And after that, at some point in time, did your husband show up? Yes. At what time do you believe, from back there, April 11th, at what time do you believe that your memory came back to you? Probably when my husband got there. So much of it is missing. After that night, um, and for the last few months, have you uh, been in therapy? Yes. And um, did you, you still work as a police officer there? No. Did you quit? I did. And this was your career? 
Yes. And when did you quit? A day or two after the incident. And um, why did you quit? There was so much bad things happening. I didn't want my coworkers, and I didn't want anything bad to happen to the city. And did you own a home in Oak or Hennepin County at the time? Yes. You, you and your husband? Excuse me. The objection is relevant. The objection is overruled. Did you own a home, your family home, for years past? Yes. And uh, did you sell it? Eventually. Before you sold it, did you move out of the state? Yes. And do you now live out of state? Yes. We have a moment, Your Honor. Yes. Thank you. I'm done, Your Honor. <clears throat>